So in the studio with us today is Delegate Elias Coop Gonzalez, and you are from? From Elkins, West Virginia, and I represent the 67th House District. All right. And what brings you here? Well, I'm just here because uh, I've been traveling for the past few weeks, and usually when, when I fly out, I fly out of Dulles, so, you know, I'll stick around here in the Eastern Panhandle and, and see some, some of my friends here. I'm friends with Mike Hornby, uh, know him pretty well, uh, definitely one of my best friends down there in Charleston. But uh, I'm here today just because I want to talk a little bit about economics uh, at the national level and at the state level, and I just want to talk about, you know, West Virginia's future, uh, because we're kind of at a, at a crossroads, in my opinion. Uh, you know, just talking about the, the national debt first, you know, I think we're, we're at around $33 trillion right now. And for me, especially as a young person, that's, that's pretty scary because we're going to have to work to pay that off. And uh, I forget which one of our, our founding fathers said this, but, you know, if, if you don't pay off your debts, if, if you run the government, you don't pay off your debts, you're essentially stealing from your, your children and your grandchildren. And this is what, you know, unfortunately is, is happening in Washington, D.C. I mean, they're not putting any limits to spending. And we're looking at the interest rates, you know, for example, I think they're, they're over 5% right now, but let's just take 5% as an example. In about 10 years, we're going to have $50 trillion in debt. So if you, if you look at it, well, 5% interest rates, $50 trillion in debt, that means in 10 years, we're going to be paying $2.5 trillion just in interest payments. And that's just, that's insane to me. That's crazy. You know, you look about 15 or 20 years ago, or, you know, adjusted for inflation, our budget was around $4 trillion or something. So that means if we got back to a balanced budget, we'd, we'd still be paying a majority just in interest, in, in interest payments. And I just think that we really need to steer the ship the right way. You know, I'll talk about maybe some, some things that we could do. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Convention of States. Um, but, yeah. You know. That's so put that in the form of a plan. You know, you can't, you, you can't nickel and dime a trillion dollars in, in spending. So we've had this administration that has loaded a trillion or two, and the previous administration loaded on a trillion or two. The previous administration to that put on hundreds of billions, and it, it's gone back. So this is not a party issue. This is a politician mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. So what, what is the plan? What are some specifics that you would put in place or would, you would like to see put in place that would – not just mm -hmm. stop the overspending, but then to pull back spending. Sure. From in, in you know, there's a, there's a few different ways you could take it. In my opinion, I think the best thing to do would be to have a, an Article Five Convention of States. Uh, so you know, there's two ways to amend the Constitution. There's the, the traditional way, which we've done uh, for all 27 amendments, uh, where you have Congress uh, pass it and then it's ratified by the states. Uh, the Article Five uh, mechanism, which is has never been used, uh, is where you have really the states. They, they have a convention themselves, and they, they bypass Congress. And the reason why I think it's necessary to do it like that at this point is just because I, I don't see Congress putting a limit on themselves. So we could pass a balanced budget amendment and make sure that they're like 49 out of, out of the 50 states. There's only one state in the whole United States that doesn't have a, a balanced budget amendment. That's Vermont. It's kind of funny because that's where Bernie Sanders from. He's, he's the socialist. But all the other states, they have to they have to have a balanced budget. I mean, I have to have a, a balanced budget as an individual. I'm sure you guys have families. You, you have to have a balanced budget. Otherwise, you're going to go into debt. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Convention of States is something that's uh, been banded around for several years. I believe you have to have 35 states for the Article 5. Mm -hmm. and, you, and we've plateaued out, at, I believe, 31, 30 or 31. And I don't see very much movement in this direction anymore. There's a lot of activity 10 years or so ago, but it's kind of died because they could not get those other states. What would you do to jumpstart the Convention of States? Mm -hmm. What I would do is, is, and I think I'm kind of doing now, is just going out and telling people how dire it is because we really are at a crossroads, you know, every state individually, but as a nation. And if we don't do something quickly, I mean, we we can see the end of a republic. And I, and I, I, hate, I hate to put it that way. I don't want to sound uh, hyperbolic or anything, but you know, I mean that seriously. Yeah, the last time we had a balanced budget, I think, was uh, under Bill Clinton's uh, mm -hmm. administration in either 98, 99. Um, and it, but since then, you're right, we started increasing our debt. And that lasted for about 25 minutes. Uh, well, it lasted for a year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> a year, that's right. But it, it did work, uh, and so it was because of the willpower of the administration and Congress working together. So, uh, you've, uh, 
shift, we'll, we'll come back to the budget in just a sure. second, but you're one of the youngest delegates uh, in the state of West Virginia. How do you compare in age to Sarah Blair? Please. Well, uh, I believe Sarah was uh, elected and then she got in at 18, yeah. I got in at 20. Okay, so yeah. Sarah still holds the record for being oh, yeah. the youngest, okay. I think she's the youngest ever in yeah. history. It, yeah. There's a cool page where you, where you can go on Wikipedia and it tells you all the youngest leg state legislators ever. I think I'm like number 41 or 42, yeah. and she's she's right there at number, number one. one. Yeah. Number one, yeah. And she did a marvelous job as well as representative. The, uh, uh, you've been active in politics uh, for quite a while. I see you're wearing a Congressman Mooney's uh, shirt mm -hmm. for the U.S. Senate. The, you worked for Congressman Mooney for a while, did you not? Mm -hmm. I, I volunteered in his campaigns early on uh, before I was an adult, yeah. you know, just uh, going on parades, throwing out candy, things like that. Uh, eventually, when I graduated high school, I went and interned for him, and, and that was a life-changing experience, just being in there and, and seeing how the sausage is made. Uh, there in Washington, D.C., and uh, Alex has been a, a great mentor. So. What do you think Congressman Mooney will bring to the uh, U.S. Senate as compared to what Governor Justice will bring? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. What I think Alex brings is that he's a reliable conservative. Um, Alex has proven himself as, you know, as a member of Congress for 10 years just to be a, a reliable conservative. And that's what just, does that mean? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> reliable conservative. Sure. Well, someone who stands up for West Virginia's values. You know, West, West Virginia is a very conservative state, and I think Alex will represent us well. But isn't that kind of a catch-all statement, yeah. uh, whichever side of the fence you're on, what's the, uh, the values of West Virginia? And if you look at the West Virginia values, uh, they they were voting Democrat as recently mm -hmm. as 20 years or so ago. Now they're voting uh, Republican. But does that mean the values in the state of the residents have changed that much in 20 years? I don't think so. I, don't I, don't think so. I, I really think there's a, the Democratic Party has changed quite a bit. And if you want to talk about specific values, you know, like West Virginia is a very pro-life state. Um, Alex Mooney, for example, you know, he's, he's a very pro-life guy, and he's very open about it, and that's something that, that I really appreciate about him. You know, very pro-Second Amendment, uh, very pro-Constitution. You know, I just think Alex will be in there, and, and he'll do a good job. I mean, there was, this was really what the, the McKinley-Mooney race was. It was a referendum on, you know, who is, who's going to be the reliable conservative in there, because both of them, you know, claim to be the conservative candidate, but the voters looked at both of, of the records, and unquestionably, they picked Alex Mooney. You know, I think there's danger that the Republican Party faces in West Virginia in particular because of what Bill was saying. That Just within very recent memory, it was not, it wasn't purple, it was deep blue. Mm -hmm. And and as you mentioned, the, the Democrat Party has moved way into, into the leftward land. But there's a difference between the, the de Democrats going too far left and permission for the Republicans to go way right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think if you if the the um, the, the values as as you speak of them, uh, I, I just think that we're not a monolithic state, and I think that there's some real uh, danger in assuming that, that there is. What do you think? Well, I mean, it, no no place is truly monolithic. I mean, you're going to have people who were. You know, of all different walks of life. I mean, originally, I'm not even from, from the state. I was, I was uh, born and raised outside of the country, actually, and I came here. Uh, but West Virginia's values is, is something that really stands out to everyone else, and it stood out to me and my family. That's one of the reasons why we moved here. Uh, but if you just look at West Virginia's culture, I mean, it's a culture of, of being pro-Second Amendment, of being pro-God, of being pro-life. And, you know, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. I, I feel like... I understand what you're saying. We're not really a monolith, but at the same time, we're not just uh, like a, a, a melting pot, right? But I mean, we, a, do, we have a distinct identity uh, compared to the rest of the country. You see, you see what I'm saying? I do, but what yeah. you say is a statement of the status quo. So we pro-Second Amendment, uh, anti-abortion, go point by point. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the status quo. So what will Congressman or Senator Mooney bring to... The, in terms of change, mm -hmm. as opposed to just keeping rudder in ships and, and sure. travel. So one of the big things is that we've seen, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm not going to mention people by name, but we've seen uh, some of our politicians in D.C. vote for, you know, large budget bills uh, proposed by the Biden administration that totally go against West Virginia's values. But are you yeah. seeing that within the West, any West Virginia race? For example, do you see 
the major competition here is obviously going to be Governor Justice. So mm -hmm. are you suggesting that he is a far left? Well, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that he's far left, um, but I would say he's he's not as, as conservative as Congressman Rudy. And that manifests itself how? Well, just in, in the records as politicians. Yeah. You mentioned that the uh, uh, Democratic Party has moved um, much to the left, and I agree with that. However, I would also say the Republican Party has moved much farther to the right in the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, as someone that is an independent, mm -hmm. I think I see both parties moving to the extreme, and especially on social issues more so than economic issues. Mm -hmm. In, in what way would you say that the Republican Party is moving to the right? I just said it on social yeah. issues. On social issues. Yeah. Tea Party. Yeah. Well, and more than that. Well, on more than that, yeah. That's, but, uh, that's not entirely true because if, if you look at the Democrat Party, even at the national level 15 or 20 years ago, the vast majority of them supported marriages between one, one man and one wo woman. Uh, and you look at even the Republican, the Republican Party today, um, and it, it's pretty split, where it was pretty resounding between both parties 15 or 20 years ago. So, I mean, it's not entirely the case, but, you know, it, it's, it's true to an extent. Yeah. When you're talking about the national level, you're adding a level of complexity. Mm -hmm. And you can make an all sorts of arguments. Uh, political analysts have been doing this for the last several years and writing books and books and books about it. Mm -hmm. And we can do the same thing on a local level or the state level, but it's much easier to understand on the state level. So my question mm -hmm. was dealing with state politics state movement of the two parties more so than the national level. The state movement of the two parties? Yes, I think both parties have moved farther to the extreme. Mm -hmm. I would disagree. I think uh, the Republicans are just uh, adhering to the Constitution and the traditional values that America was founded upon. And, you know, that's, that's what we're conserving. That's why we're conservatives. We're, we're preserving our culture and our values. So without taking a position one way or the other on, on any of these issues, what is the constitutional justification for, I think it was about this time last year, the special session that was supposed to talk, I was very new to the state at that point, I was supposed to talk about something else and ended up talking about abortion, and then this rather draconian abortion legislation went through. Where is, if as a constitutional conservative, where is the constitutional background in that yeah. legislation? We're just protecting life. The 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. But what you're doing, we're seeing this in, saw it in Kansas. We've seen it in Kentucky to some degree. We've seen it recently in Ohio. Wisconsin. Uh, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. That the, the ballot the, amendments. The party itself uh, has has been proven to be much farther to the right than what the, the populace is. How do you reconcile the, the voice of the public, the voice of the people, as opposed to the voice of the party? I, let, let's just take one example, uh, Kansas. I think that's a perfect example. That ballot amendment was written in, in a very ambiguous way. A lot of people didn't really understand uh, what exactly it was doing. And usually when people are in doubt of something, they vote no. Um, I actually reached out to some of my friends in Kansas and I said, hey, w what happened with that? You guys are a very pro-life uh, state. And they said, you know, it, it just wasn't explained very well. And so people, people, you know, were were doubtful about it. You can you can yeah. um, make you can rationalize from a lot of different directions. The sure. bottom line, though, is it passed, and with fairly significant numbers. Sure. Well, I, I mean, I'm I'm not rationalizing it. I'm just telling you what what the people in in Kansas said themselves. And on top of that, I mean, the other side ran a a very very effective campaign where they put in lots and lots and lots of money. So that's kind of, kind of a more of a dormitory debate kind of question than, than <laughs> anything substantive but as as a legislator mm -hmm. are you elected in your mind just philosophically are you in office to reflect your values because they elected you right mm -hmm. the whole package yeah are you there to reflect your values or are you there to reflect the will of the electorate yeah well it's both i mean when, when i ran for office i i told my constituents what my values are and my opponent did the same thing and they chose me to represent them now. Yeah. But when it comes down to individual issues, you can't possibly campaign on everything because we can't see the future. So when there's a, a, a mm -hmm. sticky issue that's coming up, is it, is it, you're going to be getting sure. a lot of calls and sure. emails from, from both sides. When it comes down to it, it's about principles, right? Because principles are longstanding. They've been the same at the beginning of time, currently, and to the end of time. And 
even if, if I can't foresee every issue there might, there might be in the future, people know where I stand on, on principle. Well, I will tell you, I've, I've said this on the air before, and I'll, I'll say it again, and I'm sure I'll say it in the future as well. The first candidate for any office, if a candidate can come up and speak in specific issues of this is what we're going to solve, and this is how we're going to solve it during the campaign to get out there and, and take the criticism, I'm voting for it. Um, if a candidate can go out and say that, yes, the other side has some really good ideas, and we're going to act on those ideas, even though there's a different letter after their name than my own. That's the division, and not to speak on your behalf, Bill, but I think that's what you're referring to in terms of the bifurcation of, mm -hmm. of the legislatures across the board. It's that we don't allow the opportunity for the other party to have a good idea. Sure. Well, if, and if you guys want to talk, you know, go back to talking about fiscal issues, which sure. is what, sure. what, sure. what yeah. I want to come on yeah. here. Okay. This is something that I think uh, a lot of, uh, you know, people who are more on the left and, and Democrats agree with me, at least on, the ind uh, on an individual basis, maybe not, not uh, in Charleston or, or in Washington, D.C., unfortunately, but, you know, talking about how West Virginia is, is distinct, we have a, a distinct culture, and uh, we've got a set of values that, that are uh, very in line with uh, America's founding. We need to decide, you know, what, what kind of uh, place we want to live in, right? Is it going to be uh, kind of like a, a metropolis or do we want it to be like a small hometown place where everybody you know says hello to each other everybody knows each other and one thing that I'm starting to see here in West Virginia is kind of a tilt towards corporations that I don't I don't really like uh, and it's in large part endorsed by the legislature right you'll have a, a fortune 500 company uh, you know have look at West Virginia as a prospect and legislature will come and say well yeah, we'll, we'll give you uh, three or four or five hundred million dollars to open up a, a plant here. And the issue that I have with that is that, well, you're taking money from the West Virginia taxpayer, right? People who run the small businesses, you know, people even who work minimum wage like I did for, for three years during high school. And you're giving it to these Fortune 500 companies. You know, let me take a, a Walmart for an example. I'm not, you know, I don't want to pick on them as, as a business. But if you, if you have a small community, in West Virginia, you know, let's say you have about 10,000 people there, and uh, a Walmart comes in, and you've got your, your local chain grocery stores, your local clothing, whatever. Walmart, will, you know, a lot of times they will get a break from the government, right? From the local state government, they'll say, well, you'll get this plot of land, it'll be a great deal, you'll get a tax break. And those are the things that small businesses do not get. And on top of that, you know, Walmart, they're based in Arkansas. So when it comes down to it, they're going to put their business in there to make a profit, right? It, it's not that they don't necessarily care about the community, but if, if they stop making a profit in that community, they have no problem pulling out, right? And that would be devastating for the community. Whereas if you've got small businesses there, right, run by you know, people who actually live there, whose kids go to school together, they all go to church together, and they depend on each other, that's a very different type of culture and environment. And that's something that me personally in the legislature, I want to preserve. Well, yeah, but the small businesses uh, benefit from these larger corporations. That's true. Just yeah. looking at Berkeley County alone with Quad Graphics coming in, Corning coming in, uh, uh, Macy's, you can go, and Procter & Gamble, there's a whole list of them. And our economy has benefited across the board from these larger companies coming in. Yeah, well, and, and I agree with that. I, I am a free market economist. I don't believe that we should, uh, you know, stop them from coming here. What I am against is taking money from the West Virginia tax and giving it to businesses. Hey, that's corporatism. I don't like it. And on that note, it is time to go for a break. We'll be back after these commercials for our last minute.